consistency at the highest points along the way, and so the most beautiful scenery is covered with cell phone towers all over the world now. Um, there's no s scene, uh, there's no uh, site, no vista so beautiful that you can't put a cell phone tower on it. Seems to be the rule. So, um, uh, it's a little disappointing with cell phones that they, they do um, uh, uh, sort of pollute the landscape. On the other hand, it's really nice to be connected. So, that, 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 that's the general um, uh, direction we're going to look, is how to leapfrog over the grid. <laughs> Um, my name is Nuha Al-Faham and I'm chairing this session. Uh, this is session number 4D and it is, it is titled Solar Global. Um, before we proceed with the presentation, I would like to share with you some uh, housekeeping announcements which you've probably heard a few times so far. Uh, so please bear with me. Uh, please turn off your cell phones and pages during the session out of respect for the speaker and the attendees. At the end of the presentation, there will be a question and comment session. Um, so please hold your questions until then to help us maintain the schedule. Remember also that product names may not be used uh, by the presenter nor by the questions from the attendees. Um, if you are looking to earn credit for attending this session, please, and if you are a professional, please print your name and email address on the attendance forms um, if you wish to have AIA or GBCI credit. And note, not, not all sessions qualify for this credit. However, if uh, you fill the attendance form, um, the forms and the certificates will be emailed to you within 30 days of the <coughs> conference date for sessions that qualify for the credit. If you are a student and would like to obtain the credit, please print, print your name and your professor's name on the sign-in sheet if your professor is requiring this extra credit. Now, for all the audience, Please complete the speaker and session evaluation form and turn it into the monitor here on your way out. And um, we have basically one presenter, so you need only one form for it. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, John Berry. He is an award-winning designer who works with the world's poor and teams of designers and volunteers to create affordable and sustainable <coughs> opportunity. John has degrees in mathematics and architecture from the University of Michigan. He is the founder of the Appropriate Technology Collaborative, a nonprofit that works with student teams, designers, and volunteers to create opportunity for the world's poorest people. Mar um, John's presentation is titled Bringing Light to Dark Places. Please help me welcome our speaker, John Berry. And slideshow from the beginning. And this clicker works? Actually, it doesn't. So okay, I can, I can do arrows. this. Okay, yes, I can use arrows. I'm versed in that. So you've seen this slide before three times today probably. Is that correct? Okay. So I'm not going to linger on it. Um, but I will linger on this. We, uh, the things, and Ed, we, actually this is a good idea for any talk. You should be able to, at the end of this talk, explain the difference between the northern and southern electric grids. Um, you should understand the relative cost of solar lighting versus fuel-based lighting. Fuel-based lighting is kerosene and candles, <laughs> kerosene lamps and candles. Um, explain why educating women has a relatively high value for society, and explain the concept of leapfrog power. Are those your I made them up. Uh, this is for the AIA. Um, 
Learning objectives, by the way, it doesn't show. Can we do something about that, or is that just the way it's going to be? Okay. No, it, 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 it's the top of the screen. It says learning objectives. It's been like that. It's been like that. Okay. We will see at least most of the slideshow. Okay. <laughs> okay. So my logo is cut, but that's okay because it says Lawrence Tech and the Appropriate Technology Collaborative, and um, some of the foundations that have supported us over the years. We're very fortunate to be for funded by. Um, individual donations, foundations, and now we're starting um, to uh, look at incubating small businesses in the developing world. So, overview. There is a problem. The you know, problem is uh, we're dealing with people who earn two dollars a day and less in their lives, so there's the problem of poverty. Um, there's a solution that we've come up with, uh, and um, we're learning a lot of lessons as we go along. We don't know all the answers. And there's, I'm going to encourage you to get involved uh, in this. People who are designers, engineers, thinkers are capable of helping solve the problem of poverty. Um, so the problem is 80% of the world's population is poor. That's less than $10,000 a year for a family. 50% of the world's population is very poor, and that's less than $2 a day. Those are our clients. I was once an architect. <laughs> I had um, commercial clients and a lot of residential clients and I, I had great clients um, but I have to tell you if I were to fall in the line of duty as an architect there were a thousand other architects who would take the commission that I had without and, and the client wouldn't lose a day in terms of uh, <coughs> Uh, 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 an even bigger problem is opportunity we don't create charity we don't give things away um, uh, we improve local capacity to solve problems. A lot of times improving local capacity means working for five years with a local group of people called the Water Committee in order to get a water supply built for a village. Um, and we're looking to create jobs. Here are some of the designs that uh, have been, uh, these are some examples of appropriate technology, the water supply, a treadle pump, which is just a, a stair step machine that pumps water. It's for rural farmers that live in areas that have um, one growing season, the rainy season, then it's dry for the rest of the year. And you, can, the, the, you can see, imagine images of a crusty landscape and, not, and, and, and tumbleweeds. Um, if you can control the amount of water that goes onto your property, you can actually grow crops during the dry season. And there's about 100 million farmers who live in areas where the water table's close enough that if they could get a treadle pump, they could grow crops during the dry season. And so we um, designed this with a group of students from Michigan. We put it online, and it's been picked up thousands of times around the world. Um, we now have a more modern version of this design that we worked with Michigan State to come up with, and um, it's even more compact, it's, it's easier to build, and we are considering building just the really complicated part of it, which is the valve box, and selling the valve box, and then people could build the rest of the pump themselves. So this, this allows local, um, this allows the greatest per amount of material to be built in the country where it's going to be used. While at the same time get, getting the project built. And on the very far right is the solar vaccine refrigerator. Uh, it's a very simple refrigerator that can be built in developing countries, in rural parts of developing countries. This solves the problem that in Africa, in parts of Asia, um, uh, Vaccines, there's several types of vaccines that need to be kept cold until the moment they're used. From the moment they're made to the moment they're injected into a human being, they have to be kept cold. But many people live in areas that it takes three, four days on foot to get to where they live. And four days is too long for things to stay cold. And so we designed a refrigerator you could build locally almost anywhere out of locally available materials. It uses, um, I think it's actually on the next page, same picture. Um, it uses uh, heat from the sun to refrigerate things. You just put it in the sunlight and it freezes things. Um, I know it sounds counterintuitive. I will explain it later if people are curious. Um, these are things that are all designed by architects. Um, <laughs> uh, 
uh, the solar vaccine refrigerator, well, e engineers and architects. Um, uh, this is insulation for a house, for a tin shack. Uh, it's a um, type of insulation that um, is made from a type of recycled plastic bag. We looked up the type of, it's, it's very common in develop, developing countries, primarily in Latin America. We know that this is around, it's blowing in the wind everywhere because they last so long. Um, and uh, I have a demonstration of it up at the table um, upstairs if people are interested in learning more about it, but it's, it works better than fiberglass for insulation and it costs nothing. It's a recycled material that's blowing in the wind. So if you wanted to collect bags from the side of the road and clean them, you could build, create enough insulation for your house in an afternoon. Um, this is biomedical engineering students. I'm sorry I said it was all architects. Uh, they're building a, a, a um, th that's a stethoscope that communicates remotely with a remote clinic. Uh, there's, the, um, uh, there's, there's doctors in Guatemala, um, first year out of medical school, they get assigned to a clinic in a rural area and kids come in and they're not looking good and they listen to their heart and they can't figure out exactly what's wrong with them because it takes a really educated ear to hear some of the nuanced tones that the heart creates when it has problems. Um, we created a stethoscope that creates MP3 files um, it, 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 that massages the files a bit so that you hear the best sounds, the, the ones that give you the most information and then it sends the files to a medical clinic in Guatemala City where Dr. Castaneda has an office. Dr. Castaneda used to be the head of cardiac surgery at Harvard for 15 years. Um, he's, he's the real deal, and he'll do the surgery for free. So Ca Castaneda's team, we gave them files in, in the headphones and said, listen, is this a good heart? You know, we've got the files from Michigan. Is, is, this, is, is this kid gonna live? <laughs> uh, and um, uh, his team could identify the sounds and the different types of heart disease within three or four seconds because they'd been doing it all their lives. These were very trained people at hearing, I mean, I couldn't tell the difference. Um, I don't think any, well, anyway, uh, uh, really cool device, very simple, it's just, it's just design thinking. And um, uh, solar lighting systems, what we've been doing, I'm an architect and I'm designing circuit boards for solar lighting systems that are very efficient so that we can use smaller solar panels and smaller batteries to get more light into people's lives. Um, and it takes the same thought process to design the stethoscope as it takes to design the solar lights, to design the circuit boards as it does to insulate a house or as it does to create a solar vaccine refrigerator. It's all design. <coughs> Every now and then we get an email like this, this does make my day, this makes my year, this makes my life. Um, and it does say, by the way, on my screen, congratulations for saving millions of lives with your solar refrigerator project. And it was from um, uh, somebody who had built one in India. So <laughs> we cut off a good part of that one. Um, so the number one problem for 1.6 billion is, is that 1.6 billion people have no electricity. This limits people's ability to do things when you can't see at night, when you use kerosene lamps and candles, when you have yeah, that much light um, to see by, you can't really get meaningful work done. You can't do chores, you can't read, you can't do needlepoint work, you can't make money. Um, you, the, 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 there's enough light to keep from tripping over the furniture, but there's not enough light to really keep from uh, to, to allow you to, to, to pr progress. Um, uh, another part is that it's costly. The cost of kerosene and candles is roughly $1.80 to $2 a week in Guatemala right now. And kerosene, by the way, they use diesel fuel down there. They said, oh, we don't really use kerosene anymore. We use diesel fuel. It's much more sophisticated. Um, uh, it does cost $1.80 to $2 a week to use that material. and um, that leads to this, which is, this is the world at night from outer space with all the clouds removed. <laughs> um, and only NASA can do that. Um, but you'll notice that there's this dark band around the planet um, where you don't see any light. This actually, this 
right here is one of the more populated countries. And I think it has a higher population density per square foot, I mean, per square mile, more people per square mile than the United States. And here's the United States, bright, cheerful, well lit. Um, and here's Africa with the Mediterranean coast doing pretty well and Cape Town. But other than that, Africa doesn't even show up at night. And that's because here we are, the United States, that's our population map. That's our grid. And actually, this is a little, the, the resolution isn't high enough to show that this is just like covered in utility lines. We got a lot of power. <laughs> we can connect to the grid. We're used to using tremendous amounts of electricity here in this country. By the way, when you saw those lights from outer space, that's a waste of light. We don't need to light up outer space. We need to light down here. If we could actually take all the light and just have it light what's supposed to be lit, we could save a lot of energy that way. So but anyway, there's, very, there's a huge grid. That's the population density. Using the same population density type map and grid. Um, here's Africa. Pretty dense population, huh? And here's the grid. And I actually, it, it shows proposed lines on this. Is this... I guess it's, 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 uh, it's good. Um, the red lines and orange lines uh, are proposed grids. I did erase some of the proposed ones because they're proposed, but they're not going in. The rate of electrification in Africa is actually slower than population growth. So every year there's more people without electricity in Africa. So the idea is this is an opportunity instead of building out this grid, building out this structure. Do we want to see more of this and more coal-fired power plants and more power plants everywhere feeding huge lines that then distribute electricity to all the populations? Or do we want to do something different? Find a solar replacement for kerosene lamps, for example. And um, we've started a solar power and light project um, <coughs> in Guatemala. And we found, we, we, we found a technique for getting people interested in solar, for educating a population about solar power. A lot of people don't know. They sort of know that you, know, you get free electricity from solar power, but they, they're not really very familiar with the concept in a lot of parts of the world. We teach solar. We teach a, a class called circuits and solar, and you learn about basic circuits and circuit design. You use professional equipment, something called a breadboard, which is what electrical engineers use to mock up circuits. And we teach people about how circuits are made and how to make controls for circuits. We're adding a part on, on transistors to it because the guy who created the course, he told me in five minutes how transistors work. And I thought, why doesn't everybody know this? We all should know this. We all use transistors every day. Why don't we, you know, and so I, we're adding transistors. I want, I, and the cool thing about this class is, is that is, it's designed to teach people with basic numeracy and literacy skills about circuits, electricity, and then about solar power and how to make a solar powered circuit. How to make a solar powered, how to install solar power on a house. So this, this, this takes people from basic skills through to, I could install solar on your house, okay? Um, and we want to add transistors to that because then the, one of the, there's this box right here that controls the, um, uh, the amount of power that goes into the batteries. It makes sure the batteries don't get overcharged or overly discharged. It's controlled by transistors. And so if we can get the transistor part in there, then they really have a much better understanding of why that box does what it does. Um, so, I'm really anxious to add transistors to the project. Uh, this is our do-it-yourself solar light from 2007. We had to build our own lights because it cost about $24 to $26 to buy a 2-watt LED light bulb back in those days. And um, so we designed our own circuit board, bought LEDs, just raw LEDs. We wired up our own circuit boards and we wired up our own lights and this is actually a lens from a um, lens. This is a, this is a water bottle um, and uh, a piece of recycled aluminum and it's on a piece of wood and, and this went into a lot of houses in Guatemala um, and this was state-of-the-art stuff back when we did it. We just replaced all of these <laughs> um, with, with modern ones because we're now getting 
really nice, good quality solar lights, 12 volt solar lights that replace these for a few dollars each. World changes fast. Um, here's uh, Carlos installing one of the solar lights back in the day. These, by the way, were affordable in the day. They were more expensive than what they are now. Um, but people, poor people, who were spending $1.80 a week on kerosene could afford to instead purchase one's, uh, a solar power system and um, after a period of time they'd own it outright and then they'd save that entire $1.80 a week. Now it's $2 a week and, um, and they're saving, that's a kerosene lamp, I just love the picture of this guy, um, and uh, it's lighting a kitchen. Um, it doesn't show how much brighter it really is versus not having that there. But anyway, the, the, um, that's a beautiful kerosene lamp, I think, by the way. I might trade him a light for it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, they're saving after, we, uh, one of the lights at the table upstairs um, is uh, a very simple plug and play solar light. There's a little solar panel, you stick it on your roof, you have a wire that comes in the house, you hang the light by the wire, and you turn on the light when you need to use the light. That's it. That's 30 bucks. And if you're spending two bucks a week on kerosene and candles, 30 bucks, in 15 weeks it pays for itself. After that, you're saving $2 a week. Saving $2 a week is a really big deal for some of our clients. That's a 25% increase in disposable income for our clients. That's a huge change in life. Um, and some of the effects, okay, so there's our old light and there's our new light um, next to each other. That's on an um, inverter. So that's um, slightly different technologies, but our solar lights do look like this now. The 12 volt ones look just like that. Um, they, have slightly different tech, they have slightly different circuitry in them. So our old lights and our new lights, I kinda, I'm gonna miss the old lights. I have to admit, that was kind of fun to make, make our own lights, um, but isn't worth it. So simple, the, 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 the egg light here, and this, this is a slightly more powerful version, these are like real solar panels with, with, with um, tempered glass, they're considered 20 year guarantee type solar panels, same solar panels that you get in a project here in the United States. Um, <laughs> but this one's like three and a half watts, and the one that goes with the little egg light is two watts. Um, so they're very small solar panels, but because LEDs are so much more efficient, we can, we can light a house with a two watt solar panel. Um, and what happens is then that okay, people are saving two dollars a week. And we're teaching the class so that more and more people understand that this is an option for them. And more and more people are getting an interest in this, and more and more people are understanding how to install it. So we're generating both interest in the product and we're creating interest in selling the product. And that started, I, I, I stole a name. I, I had to conf confess to Father Charles, um, who was head of MIPOL for Michigan, Power, Michigan Interfaith Power and Light for a long time, that I stole the name Interfaith Power and Light. Uh, um, and I have Mayan Power and Light. Um, and uh, steal from the best, right? Um, anyway, uh, the Mayan Power and Light project is to teach um, about electricity, uh, circuits, and solar power to uh, w women, particularly in Guatemala, um, and to then start solar businesses. We're actually, we have courses that are open to the public. Those attract 95% guys. And after two years of teaching solar and having 95% guys, I asked, where are the girls? And it turns out that girls don't take classes with guys after a certain age, especially tech classes. And I, th there's a cultural reason for that. I won't go into it because I don't understand it. It's not my area of expertise. But we did notice that when we offered an all-girls section taught by women, that 45 women signed up for it this year, 100 next year, and they want to start. They, they asked before they even started taking the class, can we get a job? doing this. So the first people to ask if they wanted to get a, to get a job in doing solar, to installing solar in Guatemala were women. And I'm really proud of this group. Um, these are the mentors who will be teaching the younger women. These are, we're teaching young, at-risk Mayan women about solar power. Um, 
and uh, they will be starting a solar power cooperative after they take the class in November and through next year we'll be helping them understand business, business practices. They do have their own business school there in Guatemala that's interested in working with them, um, but this is a formula that works. Educating people, we're a nonprofit, we can educate people. Providing wholesale solar power options, so we have a shipping container, it's almost a full shipping container now of solar material headed for Guatemala, um, so that the prices are low. Uh, they also use our designs for some of the technology that's in that shipping container, so that it's very efficient. And there's solar power systems that can, that can be sold uh, at a profit. Um, when we were doing our original solar project in Guatemala in the 2007, 2008, um, a young company using the same engineering group that we were working with uh, started a solar power business. Um, their goal their first year was to convert 350 houses to solar power, and they converted 1,000. Um, they're now, I think, going to hit a million dollars in sales this year, but that's just a tiny part of the market. So we're coming in with a shipping container full of really well thought out solar power systems from the two watt system to a 40 watt system and an 80 watt system. Everything's designed to work well together um, at the lowest possible price. So with the women, leapfrogging over, um, to leapfrog over the, the grid, um, they're excited about this, and then they also realized, uh, I said, uh, I mistakenly said, I guess they're not used to using tools. And they use needle and thread, and they, use, they weave, they're using a loom, that's a pretty big tool. They use kitchen tools, they're used, they're used to using tools, they're just not used to using carpentry tools. So we have a carpentry clinic also uh, for the women, because they've got to learn how to drive a nail, uh, use a screwdriver or electric screwdriver um, and to build things to specification um, and they were great. This was, this was a very fun class. Now I, we have, um, uh, this next picture will show it. We have Jose here uh, teaching the women. We don't put gringos in front of brown skinned people um, <laughs> uh, for education. Uh, we Gringos take a back seat, and we make sure that um, that our team teaches um, uh, in Guatemala. So our Guatemalan engineers teach in Guatemala and teach the, the women, and they've asked for him to come back. I think one of them has a crush on him, um, and uh, 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 to um, uh, they're going to review this before they actually start teaching the mentoring the young women in November. Um, but he's showing how solar power works. This is how you put your hands over it and the, and, 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 and the, and the light dims, um, that sort of thing. There, um, and here are the women, um, after they've done the carpentry part, they're now doing the electronics part. They're learning how to make electronic circuitry. They're learning how to wire up um, uh, uh, solar voltage controllers. They understand that you need a voltage controller to guard the battery. A, a, so, a solar panel, uh, no examples, um, a solar panel like this one here can put out, when you put it out in the sun, if it's a little cloudy it might put out 14 volts. If it's a bright sunny day on Lake Atitlan, which is at 5,000 feet, it'll put out 21 and a half, 22, 23 volts. Okay? The battery, the 12 volt battery that <laughs> wants to get charged by that would be damaged by 21 volts. And so this charge controller um, uh, makes sure that not too many volts go into the battery. And the, uh, the battery can also get damaged if it drops down too low. So you have the lights on, you keep them on all day and all night, or you hook up a, we have a house, a 12 volt house, small solar panel, they have a television set, a 12 volt TV. Can you imagine that? You have a 10 watt solar panel and you have a television set. You're saving your precious watt hours to watch Jersey Shores. <laughs> uh, anyway, it, uh, it, it, 
you know, we just provide the electricity and people do with it what they want. Most people do wonderful, amazing things, but some people will watch Jersey Shores. Um, so anyway, this thing makes sure that if you are watching Jersey Shores and you're draining your battery too far, it shuts it off. It won't let you drain your battery too far because if you drain your battery too far, you're shortening the battery's life. You're shortening the battery's life. Excuse me. Can you tell I get excited and I, then I mispronounce things? Okay, so this was the coolest group of people um, uh, to work with. I did sit in for part of the class. Um, a gringo in the back of the class or, or it doesn't help. People were looking over the shoulders and I was there for about 20 minutes. I made a small speech that said, you are a because you are the first class of women who are learning solar in Guatemala and you are the pioneers um, uh, for this project. And that expression is a true expression of their feeling taking this class. And I'm very proud of that. Same expression. Um, <laughs> universally, this was so cool that everybody really enjoyed learning this. I was told by the director of the women's, the, the, we're, we're partnering with a group called Starfish, um, and the, that mentor young women. So we didn't have to like go out and find, <laughs> we worked with a group that already existed that um, mentors young women and helps them find jobs and stay in school. And um, the director of the school said, many of the women who took the class had never thought they could do something like that. And it was pretty simple stuff, I mean, in some ways. You know, it's, 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 it's a hammer and, 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 and wood, and it's connecting wires together. It's, it's not rocket science, but it is rocket science. Um, actually, solar, you remember first lecture of the day? It actually comes from rocket science. It comes from, from NASA, uh, solar power does. Um, and so uh, 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 they are learning something that is related to rocket science in some ways. And they're having the time of their lives. The, this, this was the most active group of students I've ever seen in terms of asking questions. They peppered the teachers with questions constantly. And they um, seem to be enjoying things. And, um, and my leaving the room, I'm sure, helped. <laughs> so here they are with their diplomas. Oh. One guy is in the group. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know where he came from. <laughs> Maybe you just hop into the picture. Is this, is this what they call it, uh, photo bombing? Mm -hmm. uh, who knows? Uh, anyway, the, the, the one guy is in the class. Uh, that's fine, you know. Um, all right, all right. He might end up uh, part of the team. Who knows? So the results. The results, and this is, this is, this is what we're hoping for to, to get this to spread farther and farther. But the, the, there's a big point here I need to make. This is, this is maybe the key. Um, that's one of our old lights. This is one of our first clients. They saved enough, oh, here's the needlepoint where she's able to do it at night. She pulled this out to show, hey, look, I can do this at night now. Isn't that cool? Okay, that's a daughter. They're planning on set. They've had the lighting system for a while now, and they're planning on sending her to trade school. So in one generation, they went from living with a dirt floor in the mountains, surrounded by corn during corn season to the point where you can't even find their house, um, uh, to sending their daughter to trade school, which is essentially out of poverty in one generation because they bought a light. Now the world should not be so cruel as to have that be a possibility, but that is the truth. That is what's happening. And so we now have lower cost systems for people, and the idea is that we can build on this savings, okay? So that people start out, they get a system where they save $2 a week, right? And they get a little bit more money, they might be able to do, make a little bit more selling things in the market, and their kids are gonna do better in school, okay? Their kids are gonna then be like this girl, and they're gonna to go to school, and they're gonna stay in school longer, and they're gonna get a better job. And when women stay in school longer, they have a tendency to have healthier families, smaller families, they're able to provide for themselves. When women earn extra income, 90% goes towards their family. By the way, when guys make more income, 30 to 40% goes to the family. So we guys gotta take it up a notch, okay? <laughs> um, so anyway, women make more money, 
more money goes to their families, their families are healthier, they're happier, they're <laughs> um, and they're more likely to stay in school longer. Um, this all comes from getting a light. They get the first lighting system, they save a couple dollars a week, they maybe make a couple dollars more per week, they get their kids through school, their kids are making more money, they're saving a little bit more, they get a little bit more powerful system. <coughs> We're building up to a 40 watt system. With a 40 watt system in Guatemala, where you don't have to pay for heat or cooling, because the weather's one, up in the mountains in Guatemala, the weather's pretty darn nice most of the time. Um, you can charge your MacBook Pro every day from zero to 100% charged up, run four lights all day long, um, uh, and also run a television, a small, um, a small efficient television. And one of the things we might have to sell is small, efficient televisions, because people want that. That's the next thing they want after they charge their MacBook Pro. Um, is, uh, that was a joke. Yeah, right. Okay, after they charge their inexpensive computer, we're working on an inexpensive computer, by the way. Um, I can tell you about that. We're trying to get a computer that's under 100 bucks, that's connected to the internet. I'll, I, that's later. Anyway, um, so here it is. is we have this step by step, 2 watts, 4 watts, 20 watts, 40 watts. 40 watts is going to bring you pretty much into the 21st century with everything all the advantages of the 21st century. You don't need to go higher than that. Although Guatemala does have a rainy season, and during rainy season you're going to have to ration electrici electricity. Um, uh, but for most of the year, um, our clients, um, th this group of clients that had the 10 watt systems and, the, and those old lights had 100% uptime. We actually tested the batteries, five and six year old batteries, and they were testing, they were still holding a charge. So our voltage controllers were really smart, and they guarded those batteries, and they made sure that they lasted a long time. Um, we did replace the batteries. Um, so this is the system. This is a five watt solar panel. It has a 12 volt, seven amp hour battery. Um, uh, we also have a, a USB cell phone charger as part of the system. It turns out our USB cell phone chargers, they were, the specifications were that they would draw almost no power when they weren't being used. Not true. Um, they draw nine watt hours per day, which when you have a five watt system, nine watt hours is too much to lose. And so we have a switch. You turn it on, you charge your phone, you turn it off, you unplug your phone. Um, that way we save the nine watt hours that you don't need to waste um, having your cell phone charger on standby. Um, this is the basic system. You can add four more solar panels to it if you want. You can add four more batteries or a larger battery to it if you want. You can put in eight lights in your house. You can get a 12 volt television um, uh, with a collection of these uh, smaller panels or you can go up to our 40 watt system right from here. So, goals, solar goals. It, our, our goals humbly stated, are to um, start two solar power social ventures per year. We're, that's what we're already committed to right now, and we're committed to teaching at least six classes next year, so we'll probably get the two, two more solar social ventures. We're going to end up having to create territories for people where, so that they don't over, they're not in competition with each other. We're then going to other parts of the country to teach solar, and then we're going to um, Nicaragua, where we have uh, um, projects in Nicaragua, we'll be teaching in Nicaragua. After Nicaragua is Haiti, because we have contacts in Haiti that are um, really good. And those are the three poorest countries in the hemisphere. We figure if we, can, if we can start solar businesses two per year in the three poorest countries in the hemisphere, so two per year total for us to start. We're, we're not going to get that big. Um, each venture converts a minimum of a thousand houses. That's based on experience um, from burning kerosene and candles. Oh, by the way, burning kerosene and candles cr cr creates about 750 pounds of carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere every year. It doesn't sound like a lot, but when it's a thousand houses burning seven, making 750 pounds of carbon dioxide, that's a lot. When it's 2,000, because you have two businesses doing it, that's even more. When you do two businesses a year for 10 years, that gets to be a really big number. And so we're abating a huge amount of carbon dioxide. Moreover, 
where did we say this? Teach other NGOs, NGOs, uh, non-governmental organizations, nonprofits. Teach others to do the same thing. We can't handle this everywhere in the world. There are people who already run nonprofits in other countries who are interested in doing what we're doing. And so we would like to teach them how to do that. We would like to teach them, we'd like to give them our um, uh, contacts, how we arrange warehouses, how we arrange the, uh, the teaching the class so that they can also do the same thing in different parts of the world. And the idea is that then at the end of 10 years, it's not only our businesses, because not all of those ventures are going to make it. I bet most of them do, but not all of them are going to make it. But we make up for it because we're going to have other nonprofits doing the same thing. So I think at the end of 10 years, we're going to have at least 20 businesses. We may have, more th we may have much more than that uh, going on. And that's how we leapfrog the grid. We teach more nonprofits, for profit companies, anybody who will listen to us about this. We show the process of starting small, working your way up staying with your clients until they get to the point where they have an equivalent amount of power, um, enough power to join the 21st century, enough power to, to have uh, um, lights, television, computer, internet. Um, uh, we're working on some challenges with the internet because we want to stretch it farther and there's not a whole lot of uh, fiber in Africa. I think Africa has two fibers going to the whole continent. <laughs> Africa. That was at one point. And um, I mean, and that's, that's, that's just, that's a type of injustice that um, needs to be remedied. So what can we do here about this? By the way, this is this is guy in Haiti. He has a big old battery here, and he has an inverter here. Inverter changes 12 volts to 110 volt alternating current. You heard that this morning. They were talking about inverters, the very first lecture. And then he has the most dangerous looking outlet strip I've ever seen, right? <laughs> and that's his business. Is he's a roadside char charger? Am I? How am I doing on time? Am I I'm okay? Okay. Anyway, he, yeah, he. This guy, you know. He might make it look dangerous to charge more. I don't know, because you couldn't make anything look more dangerous than that. And you think, okay, this is, could only happen in Haiti, you know? And, and, and yet, this is the United States. This is, this is after Hurricane Sandy. Um, this person had a motor home that had a generator in it, so you could plug into it, and she just fired it up, and everybody came by to plug in their cell phones. How's that? Because people would walk 50 blocks to charge a cell phone. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, um, and so we're designing systems for this country that work. Uh, I was just discussing things with how things work in Detroit in terms of turning off the power during summer and turning it back on during winter for some people. That's what DTE does um, when you're not paying your bills. Um, and so what you need to do, so, so then what people do, guys go to the bar and they have a beer while they charge their phone. Um, and uh, that's another waste of time and it's a waste of money. Um, or they pay $2 to charge their phone at the convenience store or the check cashing store. We can design a small solar panel that goes in a window. You don't even have to put it on your roof. It goes in your window and it'll keep a battery charged enough so you can charge your cell phone, right? We can design one of those things for, for, so that people don't have to spend time going down to the corner or whatever to charge their phone here in Detroit. So that's on the boards. We have those. I actually um, contacted a prototyping service to, to, to start prototyping those. Those are separate models from what I've been showing upstairs. But this is a business for here. People say, what can you do in Detroit? This is what we can do in Detroit. We can make it so that people don't have to go to the check cashing store and pay two bucks to charge their cell phone in, in summer. Mm -hmm. Okay, volunteer opportunities. This is a non-commercial, <laughs> I had to strip out some of the language here. Um, we have volunteer opportunities for people that want to learn solar. If you want to learn solar and you want to learn about natural building, we have opportunities on Lake Atitlan in Guatemala. It, um, Huxley, Aldous Huxley called it one of the most beautiful lakes in the world, if not the most beautiful lake in the world. 
and it's also some of the villages around the lake are some of the poorest in Guatemala. Guatemala is the third poorest country in the hemisphere. So we have places to install solar on the lake and teach people about solar and also work learning a natural building system that they used in Guatemala back before they even did adobe. This is back before the Spanish. Um, and you can go to, um, we have student teams that go, that, that um, learn solar as a team um, together. Uh, we have teams of volunteers that are just from across the country that come together for our, uh, solar trips. Um, we're throwing in, throwing in. We have the natural building. We're also adding um, on a test basis this next year um, some permaculture uh, education because um, we have this genius permaculture guy in the same area um, who, who teaches very well. And um, besides that, it's a real treat to eat at his farm. You go to his farm, he says, everything you're eating on this plate, except for the yeast for the bread, it was grown within 25 feet of where you're standing, or 250 feet from where you're standing. Um, so that's a possibility uh, uh, to work with us. Also, you can um, work with ATC, the nonprofit. Uh, we have quarterly meetups. Meetup is a formal way of meeting other people and that have common concerns. We have meetups in Ann Arbor um, near the highway um, <coughs> uh, quarterly. And we can work on wind systems, clean water systems. We have a clean, clean water technology we need to work on. Um, uh, clean burning stoves we need to get back. We need, we, we need engineers. Uh, who, engineers in crowd? Cool. Man, you guys rock. <laughs> um, because we need engineers to help work with our student teams. We have too many student teams. I can't do it all. I'm traveling more than I used to. And um, uh, uh, so working with student teams, when they get a project like a clean burning stove, somebody's got to be able to say, Somebody has to be able to ask the engineering type questions and organize things in an engineering type fashion. There's a, there's a process to engineering a product. And we need, the, um, we need help working with students. And by the way, working with students is the most fun in the world. It's like, it's like, it's, it, I'm giving away the, like, one of the best parts of the job, but I can't do it all. So um, working with students would be great. Um, uh, also, helping us out at things like Baker Fair in Detroit or this event upstairs. Wouldn't it be fun to actually learn the 10 things that we've done in our lives as, as a nonprofit and help us at a table like upstairs because you meet the most interesting people. Um, work with students and help with tech development. So natural building on the lake, this is a um, natural building project. We try to have about as many Guatemalans as Americans working together. We had a project this last year. We had seven Americans working on solar with a Guatemalan guy, and he was in charge, and he didn't speak English, and they didn't speak Spanish, and they got along great. And they got the project done, and I mean, we were down to the last hour when we threw the switch for the first time, and nothing burned down. Um, <laughs> and uh, that was a Guatemalan leader, uh, Americans working with him, and it worked out just perfectly. He, he, he was a very skilled, communicator, even though he did not speak English. I think he spoke English, but he refused to. Um, anyway, uh, natural building is a great, you get, your, you get muddy and dirty, and um, at the end of the day, you know you've worked. <laughs> um, traveling to and from the job sites. This last year, we had a project where the truck ride up to the job site, and you're riding in the back of a pickup truck, okay? Standing up in the back of a pickup truck. If you're going to work with us, you got to at least, that's a threshold. <laughs> you gotta, but this was the worst road in the world. And I had a, two people from the Peace Corps tell me this was the worst road they'd ever been on. And if the Peace Corps guys are telling you it's the worst road, it really is the worst road. We had a blowout on that truck. They had a spare tire but no jack. And they had like 10 gringos, four Guatemalans, and a dog. And we lifted up the side of the truck and they changed the tire. <laughs> And you know what everybody talked about that evening? Was changing the tire on the truck. And how cool that was that we lifted up the side of a truck and changed the tire. Everybody thought that was like as much fun as a human being can have. So, um, so we work on projects that matter. I, we try to identify things that really um, make a big difference in people's lives. And we, ATC, have a five-year follow-up policy. So when you work on something like solar at that school um, that I was just describing, 
It's up in the mountains, up the world's worst road. I've already gone back twice to visit that site to make sure that things are still working and that they understand how to use the system. Also, our engineers in Guatemala visit the sites and they make sure that people understand how to use the system. Um, this is our Guatemalan team. Jose Ardonez. Um, he's a young, gifted engineer. He, he is out to change the world, save the world. He has as much passion about all of this as I do, and he's young and brilliant. Um, he can, I can tell you stories about Jose for hours. Um, I could do a TED talk about Jose. Um, uh, Carlos is right there with Jose. They actually work together. He's, a, um, he's worked with us more than Jose has in, um, on, so, on some, you saw him installing the solar lights, for example. He actually made the solar lights that we used in Guatemala. Ruben is our um, transportation and getting around the country expert. He knows which highways are safe and which ones are not when. We also stay in touch with the, um, uh, the embassy uh, so that we know which highways are safe when. We also stay in touch with the Peace Corps volunteers. They know what parts of the country are safe to be in, what parts are not. And there are parts of Guatemala that are not safe to be in and we don't go there. And then um, Kayla is Ruben's wife. Those are two of Ruben's children, both born during our trips. Um, <laughs> How much time do I have? Um, well, like, if you, we want to leave some time for a question and answer. Yes. Like two minutes. Two minutes? Okay. I'll go to the next slide. So this is what it's like working with us. It's, this was a 30-foot drop, by the way. Uh, underneath this slide here, I wonder if I can do this. Can I move things around? In, not in this v ver version. Um, there's a tiny little person way down there, and this you don't see in this one. Um, uh, uh, but it's 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 this is travel into a different culture. You feel like you've jumped off a cliff. You're falling 30 feet through the air. You splash into cold water, and you come up and you see the world differently for the first time. And um, so we're going to be teaching solar. Essentially, our, we'll we'll be teaching solar for the next decade, um, and continuing the Mayan Power and Light project. Um, I will retire still doing that project. Um, I will pass that off to somebody else. Uh, um, starting businesses, uh, volunteer travel, and, and working with students to design new technologies um, that make a difference in people's lives. So this is where we work. Some of the most beautiful places on earth, as I said. This is the actual hostel where we stay. It has both um, hotel rooms and hostel rooms. Hostel rooms are, are like dorm beds. There's eight or ten beds in a, um, in a, in a, in a room um, and everybody sleeps together. Um, no, I didn't say it that way. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's a common room that everybody sleeps in and, um, and it's relatively inexpensive. And so traveling with us as a student is inexpensive, relatively speaking. Traveling with us as an adult living in a hotel room is more expensive. All of our costs are way less than, um, I'm not selling something, am I selling something, is this wrong? <laughs> uh, all of our costs, uh, I won't go into it. No, I do think the next session starts in the main room, 320. Okay, is it 310? It's 318. 318, I'm sorry. Questions? You have two minutes for questions, yes. Do you have a contact or anything like that? Yeah, I have a business card. Okay. I have a 330. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The price is 330. Good, good, yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, we, we have um, about like three to four minutes for questions. Okay. Sorry, I went a little If you long. are done. Um, I'm done. Yeah. This is also where we work, by the way. It's um, one of the villages where we work. Okay. So, if you have any questions, you can start. Oh, um. For when it's that rainy season, do you guys use any kind of rainwater catchment or anything? No, but it's a great idea. Um, and there's people that, I mean, people who are, don't have water and they don't do rainwater catchment. And so that's, that's, a, that's a project for a lot of villages, a lot of small villages. That's a good program, a good idea. Question from Aaron? Yes. Um, for like the, the treadle pump, um, how do you, you said that those have been distributed or made, how do you get the information to people? Because I'm assuming they don't have access to the internet. 
So it's not like an open source. It is open source and it is on the internet. And what happens is that somebody in the country says, hey, wait, look. And, and, it, and so it, it, it follows from the internet to the people who need it. Um, it's a pretty popular design. We have actual data from people in the field now, how many people are using it, and it's in the tens of thousands. Any other question here? Who, who funds your nonprofit? We have funding from the IEEE Foundation, the Rotary International Foundation. <clears throat> um, we had a little funding from the Cliff Bar Foundation um, and a couple of other small foundations. There's a foundation right that will be traveling next month to visit us in Guatemala. I won't be there. They're going to be evaluating our program. And um, I'm letting our team in Guatemala handle that. And, uh, and then we also have uh, fundraisers periodically. We also take donations online, that sort of thing. Um, and eventually we'll be selling um, at a slight markup the solar stuff, um, which we're allowed to do under the 501c3 laws of, this, uh, of the US. What's your website? Um, Aptech Design, it's on my card. I'll give you my card. We can take one more question. Do you have any uh, cards in Spanish with Guatemala or Guatemala contact information? I have a bit, my business card is in Spanish, but um, uh, what sort of contacts in Guatemala would you like? Well, we have, we have a community who lives in Guatemala City. I'm uh -huh. just wondering how would they be in touch with your organization? Okay, I'll give you my Spanish language business card. It doesn't have my Spanish phone number on it, but um, uh, we'll talk, okay? Yeah. You can still ask John questions on an individual basis if you have more questions during the break. Um, we, I would like to thank uh, our speaker, John Berry, thank for you. his very enlightening presentation. Thank you. And I would like to present him with the certificate. Thank you very much. Again, John. It's been an honor. Um, thank you. If you haven't